Before commencing with any endeavor in life, it's good to have a plan. If we look at virtually any tooth on the planet, we could say they range between 19 and 25 millimeters in their overall length. About 10 millimeters of that overall length should be noted to be clinical crown. If we subtract 10 from 19, it gives us 9. If we subtract 10 from 25, it gives us 15. You could say that roots are about 9 to 15 millimeters in their overall length. If we further divide the roots into coronal, middle, and apical thirds, then you can see that each little section is about 3, 4, or 5 millimeters in its overall length. Now how do we use this information clinically? When you look at a preoperative film, oftentimes we see calcified teeth, long roots, curvatures, small diameter canals, and it seems to be threatening and a very big assignment. If we learn to break the roots down as we've just described, by resolving each little area, we can in turn resolve the entire challenge successfully. If we look at the preparation sequence then that could fulfill this kind of concept, we would notice that we would use small hand files, typically tens and fifteens, and use them about two-thirds of the way down the canal. The file would be set to its expected full working length, but we would never let the rubber stop reach that point. By using the instrument, until we have confirmed that we have enough space to accommodate a rotary shaping file, then we can shape this region of the canal. This is called pre-enlargement. This isn't crowned down and it's not stepped back. With the upper two-thirds optimally prepared, we can then scout the rest of the canal. And again, we could use a variety of different small size instruments, typically for most patients, a 10 and a 15, having removed restrictive dentin in the coronal two-thirds would be adequate. We would scout the rest of the canal. This is when we would get a known working length. This is when we would make sure to confirm the canal is patent. And this is when we would make the decision after pre-enlargement whether we can use rotary to length or would the case best be shaped using manual instruments. Once we've confirmed that we have a glide path, then we can shape this region of the canal, three, four, five millimeters, with an appropriate rotary shaping nickel titanium file. So you can see that in some instances where we have longer length canals, perhaps with more curvature, and maybe they're smaller diameter, we might on occasion need an 06 or an 08 to reach the full working length. Initially, when I'm doing pre-enlargement, I like to curve the file pretty much in the body of the file. It makes it like a spring. So when we're using the instrument, we contact randomly more internal walls. We like to use viscous chelators when we're securing canals, or said another way, when we're going into areas where we've never been before, that's when they're potentially most dangerous. A viscous chelator can give us three major advantages. It is a superior lubrication. It will help emulsify and prevent the readherence of vital collagenous tissue. And finally, the debris that we're generating with small sized hand files, this debris is more effectively held in suspension. Examples of viscous chelators could be ProLube, Glide, or RC Prep. When we're working these instruments in the upper two thirds, we should recognize that our rubber stops are about one millimeter thick. So if you stay back about three or four stops, you're staying away from the most delicate part of the anatomy. Remember, most canals make their biggest curvatures in the apical three, four, five millimeters. Canals notoriously divide, bifurcate, trifurcate in this region. So by staying short of this region, we are then able to shape this region with sodium hypochlorite. Sodium hypochlorite is the preferred reagent because it's what can actually digest tissue. Maybe after every four or five syringes of sodium hypochlorite, I might occasionally use 17% EDTA just to remove the smear layer as it's accumulating. And you can shape then always with an aqueous solution. This pre-enlargement sets us up for a lot of advantages. To list just a few of these advantages, when we're directing files intentionally towards the apical extent of the prep, we're gonna have more tactile control because we removed canyons of restrictive dentin. By getting pre-enlargement accomplished early, we have a bigger reservoir of sodium hypochlorite. 
As soon as we get some early shape going, our cannulas can be placed passively deeper and we can more effectively liberate accumulating debris as it's generated. This leads to more potential for one visit endodontics because when a file does reach the full working length, it's been passed through a previously pre-enlarged and clean canal. Obviously, a pre-enlarged canal can oftentimes accept a larger instrument. A larger instrument means you'll have more radio opacity radiographically. When we're directing files to length, we must change the curve from the body of the file more towards its terminal extent. The assistant can change the unidirectional stop so it's oriented with the curvature of the file. This way, when the instrument disappears deep into a canal, we can always look at our stop to know where we're headed. With the upper two-thirds optimally shaped and pre-enlarged, it's time to vacuum out the sodium hypochlorite and return to your preferred viscous chelator. Again, the advantages are superior lubrication, emulsification of tissue, and flotation of debris. We will work these instruments to the radiographic terminus, recognizing that's a little bit long, but importantly, we're not blocking the canal or working short and creating impediments that will compromise subsequent shaping procedures. We want the canal patent and we would intentionally stick a small size instrument minutely and gently through the foramen and if a file is visualized radiographically at the radiographic terminus, it is indeed a little bit long. Clearly, apex locators can be used to facilitate this procedure. Well, with a known working length and a patent canal, it's now time to decide, can we shape the apical one-third with rotary instruments, or would the patient be best served if we used a manual approach? This means we have to confirm the glide path. To confirm the glide path, simply take a 15 file that is at the full working length and pull it back one or two millimeters and slide back to length. Now pull it back three or four millimeters and slip and slide back to length. And now pull it back four to five millimeters and see if you can slide and glide back to length. If this instrument can be moved in and out without reciprocating the handle, not only do you have a glide path, you own the glide path and you'll win the rotary game of endodontics. The concept on finishing the apical one-third really comes down to a more detailed show where we'll go into these decisions about what is the optimal size to take the canal to at length and what would be the appropriate taper in its apical one-third. But for today, the concept is scout the coronal two-thirds, shape the coronal two-thirds. Scout the apical one-third, shape the apical one-third. This maxillary second bicuspid has a significant dilaceration in its apical one-third. Using the concepts we've just described can give us a successful result. First, we need to get an overall working length. This is not the truth, it's just a tentative working length. And then what we can do is work, as we said, about three or four stops short. And what you'll notice is that we've already pre-enlarged the coronal two-thirds when you're looking at the 10 file radiographically at working length. Once the 10 file is at working length in a patent canal, in this instance, it would be wise to shape this portion of the canal with manual instruments. I'll be talking about manual pro taper in another show. But a well-shaped canal becomes easy to fit a cone as cones slide easily through curvature if there's no bumps or ledges on the outer wall. The post-op film reveals the result. And we'll look at one more case, a maxillary first molar. You can notice there's a gutta percha point tracing a sinus cavity and it's pointing to lesions of endodontic origin. If you begin to look at the initial file in the MB1 and DB, you can see the advantages of pre-enlarging the coronal two-thirds of the canal, especially in the MB1. Notice the difficult curvature on that 10 file. This is an MB2, and again, it's hard to pass instruments through full lengths of canals and around decreasing radius curvatures if the file is locked up over much of its cutting blades. So pre-enlargement, again, is the key to pre-curving files 
Now we can pass pre-curved files through pre-enlarged canals, and in this really distal view, you can see the furcal side concavity on that MB root. So we must shape away from furcal danger. Well, the final result pretty much fulfills Schilderian principles where we want a continuous tapering preparation, we want to maintain the original anatomy, we want to maintain the position of the foramen, and we want to keep the foramen as small as practical. So you can begin to see in these more difficult cases, it's nice to have a plan. And the plan is the preparation sequence. Let's review quickly what I consider a much more simplified preparation sequence. Again, it's useful to divide the roots up into thirds. We will use small sized hand files to secure the coronal two thirds of a canal. Once the coronal two thirds has been secured, we can shape that region of the canal with a rotary cutting instrument. And once we have done pre enlargement procedures, we would use small sized hand files with viscous chelators to negotiate the full length of the apical one third. Once that's been scouted, this is when we would get working length, this is when we confirm patency, and this is when we would make a decision between rotary versus manual shaping procedures. The preparation sequence is critical to treating easy and difficult cases alike. You can see how the preparation sequence makes difficult cases easier to treat.